it's hard to have a substantive discussion on Syria. Um, I think it's been that way for the better part, um, certainly since last autumn's what's known in the U.S. government as the, quote, non-strike incident. Um, I think most of you remember it just as um, something that was enormously confusing, and uh, almost everyone on, I think, one of our earlier guests said, um, uh, which was something that really no one could agree upon, um, that the one thing they could agree upon, rather, uh, is that it was not America's best day. Um, I'm going to start today's, com uh, today's panel <clears throat> with um, uh, some comments uh, by Munzer, and then we're going to move to Hanin, talking about the, how, how the Syria crisis looks from Lebanon and a little bit about spillover, and then we're going to start the overall discussion. So, Munzer, over to you. Fine, thanks. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I haven't prepared a written speech. I'm going to just um, tell you what is going on in Syria right now and what I think is the solution would be, which is, I think, the most important thing, is what is the solution? The situation is very complicated. There is no easy answer right now, but why it become complicated? Why it became complicated? Because a brutal dictator, Bashar al-Assad, was allowed to track down and kill people, rape women, destroy houses in impunity for a very long time. And when something like that happens in any country, with all these atrocities are done in any country, then every day passes by, the situation becomes more complicated and the solution becomes more difficult. And this is where we are now. When the Syrian people took to the streets in 2011, they were in peaceful demonstrations, chanting for freedom and dignity. The orders were shoot to kill by Assad forces. And after a few months of these actions, the Syrian people found out that there is no other way but to resist. Then created what we call the Free Syrian Army, which is not an army, organized army, the way that you might think of when you, when you hear the word army. It's a, it's a loose structure of people in the villages and in the cities trying to defend themselves against the regime brutality. The defectors from the army who doesn't want to kill their fellow citizens, they joined the civilians, they held light arms and tried to defend themselves and continued to go on with the fight as you all see in the news until now, now what happened later is that everybody was very exhausted. The regime was exhausted with their human resources. They don't have enough fighters anymore because they're fighting the people. They waged war against the people. So he had to bring fighters from outside. Hezbollah from Lebanon came in, and they announced it. And Iraqi militias, Shia militias, they came in. They are now in tens of thousands. And of course, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, who are there mostly in advisory, but also some of them are armed. So Assad solved his human resources problem. And regarding the arms and ammunition and money, all is coming from Iran, and also the uh, weapons are coming from Russia. Now, as far as the Free Syrian Army, they were dependent fully on the help, from the help from the friends of Syrian people. 
The Friends of Syrian People are about 120 countries, and they formed what we call a core group of Friends of Syria. The core group are United States of America, UK, France, Germany, Italy, Turkey, Qatar, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Jordan. Core group decided that they want to help Syrians to reach to their goal for freedom and dignity and build their democratic state. So they helped, their strides started to help the Free Syrian Army. But the weapons came in were a limited number and not in the quality that is needed. So the, the upper hand of firepower still with the Assad regime, especially with its warplanes, artillery, tanks, and uh, many other kind of weapons, heavy weapons. So we came into a situation of a stalemate since about one and a half year. Assad has the weapons and now has the foreign fighters fighting with him, but he cannot win the war because he is having war against the people and the people are everywhere. And the Free Syrian Army, the rebels, they are under-armed, under-resourced. They cannot also win that war with such hardware that they have, but they can still fight because of their flexibility as, uh, you know, commandos fighters. One more element came, which is Al-Qaeda. Of course, the Syrian people are now very worried. I can now tell you, I speak every day with Syrians outside Syria who fled the war and inside Syria. And they are so worried about the infiltration of extremist elements inside Syria. And uh, this is something I can tell you frankly that we have never thought of, that it will happen in our country. We hear about Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, in Yemen maybe. We never thought that we will have them in our country. They are, they have certain kind of ideology that is so, you know, not welcome in our country, which is a country of modernism. We have different sects, living in Syria since hundreds and thousands of years. We have Christians, we have Muslims, we have Jews before, we have more numbered of Jews, now there are less numbers because of the immigration happened uh, about 20 years ago. We have Druze, we have Alawites, we have Kurds or, or in terms of ethnicities, Armenians, all kind of sects, they're living together. But even the Sunni Muslims in Syria they have never have such kind of ideology or uh, which is similar to Al-Qaeda. That's why it is very strange. Al-Qaeda is working in a very strange territory. It's a territory that is unwelcoming, Al-Qaeda. So there is no incubation, but the Syrian people, they, were, they had no influence of what was happening. All this bombing and crackdown and violence that that the regime done has caused the country to be completely open like an arena and many people came in without being anybody able to influence that. So the Free Syrian Army quickly, as the people of Syria, realized what kind of danger the extremists are going to pose to Syria and to the future of Syria, that's why Back uh, December 2013, about a few months ago, we declared also war against Al-Qaeda. So we have two wars fighting at the same time, two fronts, the regime and Al-Qaeda. We were able to push them back from several provinces like Idlib, Hama, the coastal areas, and uh, many parts of Aleppo. Aleppo, the city itself, it was also pushed back. 
Now they remain in control of some of the areas in the east, in Raqqa, and there is now fierce fighting going on in their Zor with Al-Qaeda because they don't want to lose their Zor because they have their logistic lines from Iraq. What I'm, what I'm talking about is ISIS, what they call the Islamic State of Iraq and uh, Lebanon. Now, it became even more difficult and more complicated that we're fighting on two fronts. And uh, that's where we are here now. What we are, that the Syrian people are really in a very difficult situation in terms of their fight for freedom. On humanitarian level, I will tell you one short story. Uh, an American think tank visited me in Istanbul about uh, two weeks ago, and they told me that they are making a paper about Syria, and they're going to write uh, a policy recommendations for the American administrations, what need to be done. And they asked me, what do you think, on what area do you think that we can be more helpful as Americans? Like, what the Syrian people need more in terms of humanitarian aid? And my answer was one word, everything. <laughs> we need everything. We don't have medicine, food, fresh water, electricity. The Syrian people are really devastated in every way possible, every way that is imaginable. A woman with three children, one of them is infant, baby. They were in Al Husun. Al Husun uh, is a castle, it's a crusade castle, very old one. Uh, about a few thousands of civilians, they went there because they were, you know, the regime was bombing all the area, so this is a castle with the thick walls. They thought that they will be safe over there. A couple of months ago, with the regime bombed that castle, actually. The UNICEF is furious about it. But uh, eventually, the, the civilians, they need to leave, really, because now they cannot stay anymore. The regime has to, took over the area. So the deal was that those civilians will have a safe passage to Lebanon, nearby Lebanon. Uh, and the regime will take over the castle. During uh, the people uh, walk to Lebanon, they came under fire from the regime. So they broke down the deal and they fired on people and many people died. This woman with three children, two of the, her children injured. The infant remained in her hand, and the fire was very heavy. So what was the decision that she should take at that, at that particular moment? If she stayed, she will die. If she ran, she cannot take the two injured children. Actually, she left behind two injured children, and she ran with the infant. And now she doesn't know what happened to them. These kind of decisions, Syrian people are taking every day. Where to run from the bombing? Where to go? How we can save our children? The food also is a problematic. Why? Certain areas are under siege with a policy that maybe you all heard about, uh, starvation. You need to starve, starvation until submission. So the regime is starving many areas. There is a United Nations Security Council Resolution 2139 ordered that this is not allowed, and humanitarian aid should be delivered in, to all areas. The regime did not 
uh, always violates that uh, resolution. There is no progress on that regard. So we have many areas where people really are dying because of starvation. In eastern Damascus, before it was in Homs, and some other areas. The other issue is that the United Nations has a program, a food program. They, they, are, they are delivering a lot of food to Syria. But the United Nations, they have certain kind of bureaucracy that they are, according to the bylaw, what they say, they are not allowed to go into any area unless the Syrian government, which is Assad, would approve that. So, of course, Assad is not approving any humanitarian convoy going to the areas that are liberated under the control of the opposition. Then we have a great deal, a big problem over there. United Nations is still insisting that they don't want to work outside the regime control. Just recently, 30 international lawyers from the UK and USA sent a letter to the United Nations saying that there is no actually legal ground for the United Nations not to deliver cross-border aid. This is a hot story right now. We are pushing our friends in the Core 11 to put pressure on the United Nations to just get those convoys and deliver food and medicine to those people in need. Um, so at the end, uh, I will just quickly say uh, what should be the solution now in Syria. To tell you frankly, the Syrians by themselves are not able now to solve their problem. It has become now an international level problem that needs to be dealt with by international community. So the international community need to be thinking now out of the box to find a way how to deal with the situation because if it was left, it is left like this, it would deteriorate more and more Al-Qaeda will be more in power and the regime, Assad regime, will continue killing people, causing all this humanitarian catastrophe to even increase. So international community need to come together to find a solution. United Nations Security Council is in deadlock because everything that is getting veto from the Russians I mean, the Chinese, we went, to the Chi we went to China. They used veto three times before, but now it seems to be that they are more in having more, more neutral position. But the Russians, no, they will still use the veto. So we have also to see how we are going to break that deadlock in the United Nations Security Council. What we are explaining now here when we are visiting Washington is that international intervention now, military intervention, is not on the table. It was, it was thought about and talked about back in August when Assad used chemical weapons, but now it is not anymore. And we understand, of course, the elements that is causing this to be um, not uh, out of the discussion. So what we need is to strengthen the fighters, strengthen, strengthen our fighters, in order to be able to fight both Assad regime and Al-Qaeda in a more effective way. This strengthening is by providing the resources and the hardware in enough quality and quantity in order to face that danger. As for Al-Qaeda, an international effort need to be also done in order to dry their logistics. I mean, 
there are so many Syrian fighters, they just want to fight the regime, and they go and find that some elements of Al-Qaeda, they have everything. They have ammunition, they have weapons, they have food, they have salaries. But from where they're getting those? And those Syrian fighters, they, they, they don't believe in that ideology. But they are so devastated, they just want to fight the regime. So those resources of Al-Qaeda need to be dried up, and this is an international effort. This is not Syrians by themselves. They cannot do it by themselves. So drying Al-Qaeda channels, logistical channels, and opening the logistical channels for the moderate elements is something that I believe will be beneficial. Assad staying in power is not an option. Why? Because first of all, this will not end the killing. It will make it even worse. And it will not end the war, and it will not end the threat of the extremists. On the contrary, it will increase the threat of extremists, because extremists will be able to recruit more people based on frustration. So Assad must go, and the extremists must be confronted. But before the extremists are confronted, we need to dry their resources first. So we have an easier job. And we need also to get rid of the main cause of the problem, which is the regime who is continuing, as we speak, killing hundreds of people every day and causing displacement of thousands of others. Thank you very much, Thor. Sorry I took a long time. Munzer, thank you very much. Uh, and now over to a little bit about what spillover of the Syria conflict looks like. We'll hand things over to Hanin. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, obviously, I'm coming from Lebanon, so I cannot but talk about Hezbollah's involvement in Syria and how this is affecting uh, Lebanon and the region as a whole. Uh, the thing is that as the US is talking to Iran, Iran was acting in the region and buying time and b the bar ga gathering all the bargaining chips needed during that time in order to strengthen its regional dominance in the region. What happened is that Iran now owns the ground in Syria. As we speak, Iran managed to link the coast of Syria through Hamas. Yesterday, the deal was over. They took over Hamas. The Iranians and Hezbollah negotiated the deal, not the Syrian regime all the way through Damascus to the Lebanese borders, suburbs of Damascus, they have what they wanted. And regional dominance is actually Iran's priority, more than anything else, more than negotiations, more than talks. And this is now what they have. Now, presidential elections is taking place next month. And Assad is running and will probably come back as an, a president. Not the same president he was years ago, probably he's gonna be Iran-made president, like Emil Ahoud of Lebanon, well, during the Syrian hegemony in Lebanon. That's the price for survival, and that's the price that Assad had to pay for his survival. Definitely, if Iran leaves tomorrow, if Hezbollah leaves tomorrow, Assad will fall the next day. The Iranian made sure that we all understand that, and the Iranians made statements making sure that Assad understands that. This created some problems inside Syria, but everybody understands this now. But why is Iran so much invested in Syria? Why is Hezbollah left Lebanon, moved most of its operations to Syria, and now is fighting Iran's war in Syria? Hezbollah now is Iran's regional militia, along with Iraqi fighters and groups. They are fighting regional, uh, Iran's regional war for dominance, and that's their main mission now. This is Hezbollah's new mission. And their main enemy is the Sunni. Iran is doing that, obviously, for political reasons, to secure the line between Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. But also, ideologically, we have to understand where Iran is coming from. With the Islamic Revolution and the Wilayat al-Faqih, Shiaism and the expansion of Shiaism, of political Shiaism, is a must. Iran cannot be a state. Iran has to be an empire. And this is part of Iran's ideology. 
And also, this came along with this differentiation between the political identity before Wilayat al-Faqih and after Wilayat al-Faqih. In Lebanon, for example, the Shia has always been like passive players, always kept to themselves as a minority and were passive political players. With Musa Sadr before the war, their political identity started to develop, but was always been linked to the state. Lebanese state was still a reference for the Shia, despite this developing identity. But with the Wilayat al-Faqih and the presence of Hezbollah and the, and the power of Hezbollah growing in Lebanon, the Shia had to become more aggressive players, active players. And this is also part of the ideology of the difference between passive waiters of the awaited Imam al-Mahdi to active waiters. So now what's happening in Syria for a lot of the Shia in Lebanon is actually active waiting, paving the way for the Imam to come back. It's part of this whole secular, uh, sorry, sacred uh, uh, war. And a lot of Shia believe that they're, that they're fighting a, 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 a sacred war. But now what? Assad probably will come back as a president. Iran and Hezbollah managed to secure what they need in Syria, strengthening the regional dominance, gaining all the bargaining ships they need for any negotiations in the future. But the question is then, then what? There are probably between the, Syr the, the Syrian army fighting, reports suggest that there are like 50,000 uh, 50, Syrian army fighters. And in addition, additional to 40, thousand uh, um, Hezbollah fighters, Iraqi fighters, Alawite, Shabiha, you name it. And that's it. But these are surrounded by a region full of Sunnis. And the Sunnis in Lebanon, in Syria, and everywhere else, remember Hezbollah was founded, was created because of the feeling of injustice felt by the Shia community in Lebanon. This injustice is now felt by the Sunnis in Syria and Lebanon. The feeling of injustice, the feeling of fear, the feeling of being, you know, like suppressed by this imposed power of Iran in the region is definitely going to create same kind of extremism that created Hezbollah. The extremism in the Sunni street, the moderates will dissolve on both sides and the huge gap created by the absence of the US and the West and all the moderate powers uh, in the world is also going to be filled by these extremists. How is this going to end? Not well. Most probably, the next plan is Iran will definitely not leave Syria. The Sunnis are going to react. Extremism will flourish. And this will lead to a bloody regional sectarian war. And how are we going to end this? I don't know. Hopefully, uh, Something's, something's gonna give, something's gonna happen, something has to happen to stop this, but so far it's happening as we speak. Let's talk about Lebanon. Spinning over, spinning over, it's over. <laughs> it's, it's happening. Uh, the war in Syria and the involvement of Hezbollah in Syria has strengthened Hezbollah in Lebanon, not weakened it, although they've moved mostly to Syria, but Hezbollah in Lebanon is still very strong. They still control the state institutions. Uh, now the presidential elections are taking place. Because of Hezbollah's strength also, we are not going to see uh, a president without Hezbollah's approval. But this is not it. In Lebanon, Hezbollah's plan now is to crack down on all Sunni cities in town. It started with Saida, with uh, in June of last year with the operation against Sheikh Ahmed al -Asir. Success, great. Then in Arsel a few months ago, also Hezbollah now has checkpoints around Arsel. This has never happened before, like checkpoints for Hezbollah. This is a very sh uh, militia behavior that was never uh, felt in Lebanon. You see Hezbollah checkpoints. 
Uh, and these checkpoints are, of course, not operated by, by Hezbollah fighters that are trained and that. These are all like either in Syria or still in the south. These are operated by Hezbollah's militia in Lebanon because Hezbollah is a regional militia for Iran in Syria, but they have their own militias in Lebanon, which is the Sarai al muqawami the uh, uh, resistant brigades, which is basically uh, uh, a bunch of Zaran, uh, 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 thugs that fight Hezbollah's uh, uh, dirty little wars in, in Lebanon. And Arsil is now also taken over by Hezbollah through the Lebanese army, of course, that like they don't do this themselves. And now the security plan is also happening in Tripoli. Tripoli is a big, the biggest probably Sunni uh, city in Lebanon, and it's working. Today, the main, main, main uh, Sunni uh, leaders in Tripoli today has surrendered and to, 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 to the army intelligence. So far, it's working. But this is also creating injustice. And this injustice is not going to end well. This feeling of uh, the Sunnis being uh, uh, cramped down by Hezbollah and the Lebanese army versus Hezbollah's militia being the untouchables. So this is definitely not going uh, to end well. So the security plan that has been taking place in Lebanon is working so far. Fe uh, the Shia in the southern, the southern suburbs are feeling a little uh, in the Hermel and, and the uh, areas where uh, explosions took place uh, recently, suicide bombers, are feeling a little bit more relieved that this is, has kind of calmed down. But one more explosion, and probably this is going to happen at one point, it's going to take time, but uh, Islamist leaders are arrested, others will come and fill this gap. So eventually this is going to happen and eventually this frustration by the Sunni streets and this feeling of injustice is going to get out in one way or another. And then again, what's going to happen? How many people are going to, how many more young Shia men are going to die in Syria until the Shia community realizes that the divine victory that Hezbollah promised against the Sunnis is not going to happen? And of course it's not going to happen. The minority Shia, how much... Uh, they're still more organized and they have a head, but still they're a minority. And definitely the divine victory is not going to happen. Imam Mahdi is not going to show up. So eventually the Shia will just find themselves in a position where they're lose, they've lost everything. They're surrounded by everybody hating them. They can't, have, uh, they, they can't lead a simple life, but then it will be too late. And then... The, the war is not going to stop, and, and I'm sorry I have to end with like a very uh, pe <laughs> pessimist note, but uh, this is going to be very, very, very hard to contain the growing Sunni uprising and the Sunni anger in the region because of Hezbollah's behavior. Thank you. Thank you, Hanin. Um, okay, we have a perspective dealing with Syria looking outward, and then from the borders of Syria, perhaps looking inward or also looking at impact on, um, on, on her own country. But, uh, Munzer, I want to start with you. Uh, you were part of the negotiating team in Geneva, uh, which, and just to give a little bit of background, the basis of, um, of the talks recently in Geneva that I think some of you uh, saw in the press, read about in terms of analysis from the Washington Institute, is based on something called the Geneva Communique of 2012. Okay, and the Geneva Communique of 2012 talks about a negotiated transition in Syria. Um, and actually that agreement, which was between the United States and Russia and the Western countries, um, uh, was actually codified in another resolution, which is Resolution 2118, and that resolution deals with ridding Syria of its chemical weapons stockpile. And uh, that came after the non-strike incident uh, last autumn. So it, and it's actually the Geneva Communique is a full annex of that. So the, the basis of these talks were for the, and basically here's how it would work, the United States and the Western countries would work with the opposition to bring them to the table. And the Assad regime, uh, uh, sorry, the Russians, uh, who are the main supporters of the Assad regime, would bring them to the table. Um, during those talks, the Russians decided um, that they were not going to uh, deliver on their part of the deal, i.e. 
the regime came to the talks. They sat down with Munzer's team, um, but they refused to talk about a transition. They only wanted to talk about terrorism. Uh, and um, despite the, uh, the influence of the United Nations um, and their negotiators, they were unable to come to anything. During those negotiations, uh, the, the Assad regime actually increased the use of what are called barrel bombs. And barrel bombs are crude explosive devices um, that are dropped from helicopters on, uh, on civilian populations. And the use of them actually peaked um, during and since the, the Geneva negotiations. In fact, Samantha Power went on the record and said that during the Geneva negotiations, we had the highest civilian death tolls in the history of the Syrian conflict while the regime and the opposition were at the negotiating table. So my question with that long wind-up is to you, Munzer. And I know that you're, you're part of a delegation that's here in Washington. President Ahmed Jarba is here also uh, meeting with the think tank community and government officials. How, what is your proposal for dealing with the barrel bomb threat inside of Syria? I mean, you talked about the need for more sophisticated weapons. What specifically are you asking for? Uh, it's, a, it's a long question. Yes. <laughs> uh, you want me to talk about the Geneva communique and the process or only about the barrel bombing? You can talk about both, but uh, make sure you hit both of them. The communique was issued on 30th of June 2012, and it is actually it's a very good document. It's detailed. It's a roadmap for a solution in Syria, a political solution. The communique, it it says that uh, the Syrian people has expressed very clearly their aspiration for a new state that is pluralistic, uh, that respects human rights and rule of law and democratic. So exactly uh, the, what the Syrian people started the revolution for, and it puts, among many other things, uh, a roadmap for a political solution by a political transition, as it is mentioned in the communique, through establishment of transitional governing body with full executive authority, including army and security forces. Now, political transition is basically a power transition, means that the regime should leave the place to a transitional governing body uh, that has to be mutually agreed upon. Mutually means the opposition and Assad regime, and here where the you know compromise or also the complicity complexity is. But altogether, if the communique is accurately and fully implemented, it will actually lead to a good solution because. It says that this transitional governing body will take steps towards the democratic transition. First, they should establish a founding committee, and then the founding committee should have a referendum for their approval from the people, writing a new constitution, and then an election with international monitoring, free elections. Before all that, of course, stabilizing the security situation and achieving uh, um, a permanent ceasefire. Security Council Resolution 2118, it's mostly about the chemical weapons. But in uh, clauses uh, 15 and 16, it talks about the communique. It says that this resolution fully endorses Geneva communique and in the article after that, it says that we call for international conference for the aim of implementation that communique, starting from, and this, uh, this resolution saying, starting from the political transition. It means that the transition itself is the key to the solution of the rest of the problem. Now, of course, knowing Assad regime, the way they are built, they are not the kind of a regime, a dictatorship that will come to the table and hand over power. But the Russians and the United States, the sponsors of the process, they were counting on uh,
putting certain kind of pressure in order for this to happen, this political solution to happen. In our coalition, we had resistance for going to uh, Geneva, participate. I am one of the people who uh, were, you know, were trying to convince others that we should go. Why? Because the communique is good, it will achieve democracy. At the same time, this compromise that uh, is mutually, mutually agreed upon transitional governing body, this can be done because we will choose the elements from Assad regime who did not commit crimes. And then we include those elements and we give a message of inclusion that the new Syria will be for everybody, even for the people who were pro-Assad, but they did not commit crimes. But the others, they said, we cannot go and sit with those murderers on the table and speak with them, and we will not accept that they will be part of the transitional period. Eventually, we made a vote. Uh, I was getting a lot of heat because I approved Geneva, but eventually the vote uh, approved that approved to going to Geneva. We went there, and uh, the regime, of course, did not engage seriously at all. They were sitting in the room, calling us names. They are saying you are traitors and you should be executed, and uh, all kind of things. They did not even wanted or agreed to discuss anything related to political transition or a real solution. And as you know, the process has failed. It is still valid, forming a transitional governing body in Syria is still a valid solution. It can, be, it can happen, but we need first to overcome the security problem, the war. You cannot have that until you get the regime out of the picture, one way or another. But still also, uh, it's, there is a still possibility that we include also elements from the regime. There are so many employees in uh, Assad government who are basically inside their opposition, but they cannot express it because the danger is very high. The regime, the Assad will kill them and their families and, every, uh, and even brothers and sisters and everybody. So we know that not everybody over there in the government are bad guys, but there are really some uh, heavyweight bad guys over there that need to be going on trial. So the, the solution is still valid, Geneva communique is still valid, but there is no partner for it from the regime side. Now regarding the barrel bombing, barrel bombing is uh, a random weapon is used against the civilians. And this is what we call slaughtering to submission. It's a collective punishment for all the civilians that are under areas where the regime is not controlling anymore. Uh, about a week or 10 days ago, one of the bombs fell over a school where they are having a children, a children art uh, exhibition, a children's drawing, children drawing. Uh, the exhibition was showing that the, 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 the children in Syria, they were so devastated from the, all the violence, and they were drawing only tanks and, and, and weapons and people dying. Uh, and this is, this is something that needs to be dealt with, of course, in the aftermath. But also, the, the exhibition is also calling for hope for future, because these, the same children who are making these drawings, they are the hope for the future, that in the future they will, they will be in peace but the place was bombed by Assad and many children died and the teachers died. This is the fourth time a school, elementary school is being bombed in Aleppo. Barrel bombs, 8,000 of them f fell over Syrian uh, civilians, 8,000 barrel bombs and the, the, the deaths are about 20,000 died only from barrel bombing 
20,000, most of them are civilians. Now, how to counter this? They are being dropped randomly uh, most of the time, but sometimes, uh, you know, intentionally into a certain areas, but most of the time randomly over civilian populated areas by helicopters. And the helicopters are flying more over than 4,000 uh, meters in uh, altitude. So the small kind of uh, you know, anti-aircraft uh, machine guns, they cannot reach that high. And even some kind of, even the missiles that are not uh, very sophisticated cannot reach that high. But those uh, warplanes and helicopters, they can be shot down very easily. There are weapons that can shut down those helicopters. And today, if we, our fighters has those arms, sophisticated weapons today, tomorrow we can save hundred, hundreds of people's lives immediately. It's instant effect because the barrel bombing is happening every day and people are dying every day. So if we are shutting, if we are able to shut down those warplanes, we can immediately save lives. But unfortunately, we don't have that weapons. And the part of uh, what we are asking our friends, whether in the United States or the rest of uh, Friends of Syria core group, that we need to also be able to get this technology. Yeah. Thank you, Munter. Now. While all of this horror has been going on, and that's the only word that I know to explain it all collectively, um, and, the, and the operations that Hezbollah has carried out um, with, this, with the Assad's forces along the Lebanese frontier, we've actually seen a spike in refugees into Lebanon. Now, Lebanon, just to bring you all up to date, was already full of Syrian refugees to begin with. Um, it's never, the border's never really been fully demarcated. I think a lot of you know this. Um, but the largest outflows have occurred since the, um, uh, since the last United Nations meeting, and they're, by some estimates, they're looking at one million Syrian refugees, at least, in Lebanon, more. so uh, perhaps more. That accounts for roughly a quarter of the population, and according to the UN estimates of the, of the refugees that we know about, 96.2% of them, or maybe it's 92.6%, anyways, are Sunnis. Now, the reason why I'm at putting it in sectarian terms isn't to make it sectarian, it but rather Lebanon, Lebanon is a sectarian-based political system. You cannot avoid it. So what, what has been the effect on Lebanon? And then most importantly, what are the government's plans there to deal with this in the, long, or in the short and the long term? Okay. Uh, I think one million are the registered refugees. And the non-registered are much more than that. So I would double the number easily. And this means... The population of Lebanon is 4.5 4 4. 4. or 4, 4 something. But So basically, this is half, of, almost half of the Lebanese population. And they're still coming in. And uh, don't forget that we also have half a million Palestinian refugees who are also Sunnis, and then some Iraqis and Sudanese, etc. So you can easily say that more than half of the Lebanese... Uh, of, of the more than half of uh, the refugees are more than half of the Lebanese population. Of course, because of Lebanon's sectarian nature, uh, because of all these refugees are Sunnis, this is definitely creating fears among the Lebanese in general, but also among the Christians. And for, for Christians in Lebanon are not a minority as they are in Syria or in uh, other uh, countries in the region, but with this influx of refugees and fears, everybody remembers how the Palestinians came to Lebanon and stayed, and everyone thinks that Syrians are coming also to Lebanon to stay, although this is, there's a huge difference, you know, like, the, eventually they will go back. It's not like uh, they want to stay. In terms of plans, I don't think the, the, the government has any plans. A lot of uh, political leaders want them to go back. A lot of people uh, are suggesting uh, uh, refugee camps. 
but so far the government doesn't have the means, the money, or, or the strategy to uh, implement any of these uh, suggestions. Uh, creating refugee camps, it means that they need to uh, acknowledge the presence of these uh, refugees, and also they need money to create these camps and provide aid. With the result of the lack of thereof, the lack thereof of these of these plans is that the refugee, Syrian refugees are spread all over Lebanon, uh, not only in Sunni areas, but also in uh, in, in my, ta my town in the south, for example. You know, like it's which is. Hezbollah-controlled town, it's definitely, uh, the Syrian refugees have no choice but to go there now because they, there's no space for, there's no place for them anywhere else. And they just keep to themselves and they have to, you know, like suffer because of all, all this like uh, uh, racism. And don't forget that Lebanese people sometimes can be very racist, you know, and like this is not uh, helping, you know, like I, I it's, Sometimes it's just, you know, like a matter of, of racism. Sometimes it's a matter of uh, uh, poverty. And poverty can lead to many things. And if the aid is not coming, then a lot of these people will have to find a way to, uh, to, to provide for themselves. And this might mean that they might join uh, extremist groups in order to, to, uh, to survive. And uh, at the end of the day, if you have nothing to lose, and you are frustrated, and you can't feed your family, and you can't really survive, you have nothing to lose, and then eventually, revenge and uh, suicide bombing can be the only solution. And I guess this is uh, inevitable at one point, even like if 2% of these refugees decided to do that, that's enough. Right. I, I mean, now to talk about, you know, I had recent discussions and I usually say, well, Syria used to be a very relatively small topic to talk about with the U.S. government or just in general in the Middle East, always a centrally located country, but um, now it seems to be, as we've talked about, affecting lots of things. And extremism is one that comes up more and more. Now, one of the major arguments mm. that has been used to not supply weapons to the Syrian opposition has been that they are afraid that they'll fall into the hands of extremists. But actually, and a lot of my colleagues here at the Washington Institute, um, Jeff White in particular, have, have been writing about groups recently in which we see American-made tow missiles, anti-tank weapons, in the hands of armed groups inside of Syria that are not that are of, of the moderate opposition. Munzer, what is your relationship with some of those groups that are using the tows? Do you have a deep relationship with them? Is it a linear one? Ex explain a little bit about um, about how these networks might work between the political side, which you work on, and these moderate uh, military groups that are inside the country. As, as I said before, uh, the Free Syrian Army started with many, many brigades working separately in many areas. Um, then there were the need to get those together in some, some kind of coordination. About one and a half year ago, or a little bit less, uh, there was uh, a conference in Antalya in Turkey where the representatives of 400 different brigades met together and they have elected what we call now the Supreme Military Council, SMC. Uh, 30 members elected by the 400 brigades and they were representatives of the brigades on the ground. And a bylaw was written at that time that this Supreme Military Council is head by uh, the Minister of Defense. Minister of Defense for Interim Government was not there at that time. We did not uh, elected ministry at that time. Now we have, before we didn't have. But it is written in the bylaw. And there should be a chief of staff for the Free Syrian Army who is also going to lead this uh, SMC. Now, some of the, about five of the commanders who were in the Supreme Military Council, they died in action, and some other commanders, they left, but we still have uh, about a little bit more than 20 of them, they are still there, and the Chief of Staff for Free Syrian Army was uh, General Salim Idris. Now, recently, the chief of staff is changed into General Abdullah, and he is over here also with us in Washington. 
and the new chief of staff is trying to uh, give more organization to the to the institution and make it more in uh, you know include include more brigades because this supreme military council does not include everybody but includes many but not everybody the brigades who are using the tow missiles the american made tow missiles right now they are connected with the smc uh, the commanders of those brigades are in the smc and uh, the the american aid in terms of uh, Free Syrian Army is is working is going to work now with the new uh, chief of staff for Free Syrian Army. Did I answer your question? I think you did very well. Um, I think at this point, why don't we open it up to some questions uh, from the audience? We've been talking a lot about Syria um, um, in the in the run up to this. I spoke with both of our guests here today and said that this conference is. I didn't give an exact percentage, but it's been a lot about Syria. So. Um, who would like to ask the first question? I can't see really faces out here, but if we could have, who has the microphones? There's one, is there another one? Okay, great, so Barbie Weinberg. I've been asking for a while now and I've always gotten a negative answer, but it sounds to me as if you're talking about the possibility of a Sunni, Shia, Indonesian war, region-wide, starting in Syria, in Lebanon, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. That's a pretty frightening prospect. It is. Spreading. <laughs> it's uh, starting in Syria. We've witnessed it kind of in Lebanon, but uh, sectarian tension is on the rise, and this team is going, it has to go up somewhere, and the region is boiling with the sectarian tension. It cannot uh, stop unless something major happens. So, Unfortunately, this, that's, uh, that's how it's heading. Jonathan Mitchell. Hi, earlier uh, today we saw a film clip of the president uh, talking about providing aid to, uh, to the rebel forces. And um, he indicated that he was providing that aid. Um, do you, to what extent do you see it? This was, a, this was a clip of his comments in Manila, which you might have seen, uh, Munzer. Yes. Uh, the United States is the biggest contributor in terms of humanitarian aid. More than $1.7 billion so far is provided uh, for Syria from the United States. But I think most of this money went to the United Nations, like Red Cross, Red Crescent, uh, World Food Program. And it is helping people on the ground a lot with food and medicine and humanitarian aid. But as I mentioned earlier, there is still that limitation with the United Nations activities that cross-border operations need to be done. So United States also realized that and for some time now. And they directed uh, some of that humanitarian aid into a cross-border operation. So we have in uh, Turkey, in southern Turkey, we have um, an institution, it's belonged to our coalition, which is called ACU, Assistance Coordination Committee. And uh, ACU is coordinating between the uh, contributing countries and the uh, the people on the ground who are the councils, the local councils, and the local NGOs who are receiving those. So there is uh, one uh, American official, his name is Mark Ward, is working very closely. He's living there in Gaziantep in southern Turkey and working very closely to our ACU and providing the American aid there to be delivered inside. So there is a very active role in that regard by United States. Now, the other thing is that also the United States is providing what we call non-lethal uh, aid for the opposition. And it providing non-lethal equipment for the Free Syrian Army, including telecommunication equipment, sometimes cars, um, food for the fighters, um, and those kind of things. And also it's helping our uh, political uh, opposition with uh, capacity building and institution building. So 
a lot of a lot of help we're getting. Yes. I got the impression from your comment earlier that you didn't see any help coming. My comment? Yeah, yeah. I think that was regarding lethal assistance. L lethal assistance from the United States is still not a f is not in an overt in terms of an overt program is not provided. There are covert programs in which it is alleged uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, the United States is providing lethal assistance. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. As I understand Hanin's comments, there's approximately 90,000 fighters on the side of Hassad. And you That's talk, some of the reports suggesting. More or less, 90,000. Mm. Uh, and Monsieur, you haven't been clear in telling us. You have 200 brigades currently, maybe in operation. How many, how many fighters does that contain, consist of? How many people are, do you count, count as a brigade? Against Assad. Yeah. In, in, the, in, your, in the opposition armies, you said there were some 20 brigades? I'm sorry, uh, 20, 20 commanders, 200. In, 200 in, in, the, in the Supreme yeah. Military yeah. Council. One, yeah. one year ago, there were 400 brigades. Um, one and a half year ago. Many of them, they formed a conglomerates now to coordinate between each other. But I think that the fighters against Assad are more than 100,000 now, 100, 150,000. Right, so 150,000 takes a lot of munitions, a lot of weaponry. Where are, you, where are you getting the ability to get the quality? I mean, they're getting the top line stuff from Iran. Where, where are you getting this without America's assistance? We are getting the weapons and ammunition now from the Arab states who are supporting the revolution, including Saudi Arabia, and Qatar, and UAE. The tow missiles, I don't think, are the shoulders, the air missiles that shoot down the planes. What, yeah. what, what do you really need? I mean, to shoot down the planes that are flying at 4,000 meters, you need something more than a tow missile. Yeah. What, what do you need tow to shoot down against planes? tanks and military equipment? Yeah, there is, there is uh, a technology available to shoot down planes uh, uh, above 4,000 meters height. And uh, so some more sophisticated weapons are needed. Uh, I don't know if it is possible, but maybe also more guided uh, weaponry is uh, going to be very useful. And also a help with the more organization, uh, an organization building and the institution of the, of the SMC. While you're here in the States, are you seeing any light at the end of the tunnel and getting some of that equipment? Well, we have to, we have to stay optimistic that uh, this is uh, a legitimate request. The political solution reached to a deadlock because of the regime. And it is very obvious that the asset calculations need to change in order for Assad to come back to the negotiating table. And you cannot change his calculations unless you put a real pressure militarily on the ground. So in order to put that pressure, you need better weaponry. And at the same time, in terms of humanitarian level, you need also to save the lives of those people dying every day from that, you know, uh, war plane bombings. So it is a very uh, logical and legitimate case to put from our point of view, and we think that uh, it's important. Uh, I don't know what will be the result from, uh, from the, our friends here and the administration. But uh, we have to try. Right across the table. Thank you. Um, my first question is about the advances this week in homes. Do you think that can be reclaimed, or do you think that's becoming a fait accompli? And the second question is the situation of the Kurds, if you could talk about that and what their aspirations are. It's very hard to say what's going to happen next, but uh, it's, I can't say it's final. Nothing is final in Syria. Nothing is fait accompli. Hamas is now taken by uh, Hezbollah and the Syrian regime, but the rebels left with their weapons. They are still there, and they still have their weapons, and they're determined. So, yeah, they might come back, and nothing is final. Everything is uh, uh, subject to changes all the time in Syria. This is, this is Syria, and... This is uh, not going to, God knows, Yanni. Uh, I don't know if you want to answer the Kurds question. I'd rather not. Kurds? Mm. There are many 
Kurdish parties, political parties. They have more political parties than us. Uh, and uh, those parties, they come together and they form the Kurdish National Council. And then uh, we found out that it is very important that we include that council in the coalition. We had some Kurdish members of the coalition before, but they are, the number was not enough and the parties, they were not represented. So about a few months ago, about uh, six months ago, we reached an agreement with the Kurdish National Council and they, we have added 12 members in our coalition from the Kurdish National Council and we come together with the Kurds in unity. Now, the, the demands of the Kurdish population in Syria are ranging from self-governors in some kind of uncentralized government to the extreme of independence of certain areas, full independence of Kurdish territory. And, uh, but most of them, they have demands of that they just want to run their local affairs, but they will still recognize a central government in Damascus, and this is logical. And eventually, I think that we should always have more decentralization of local governors in all the governors, not only in this particular area, but in terms of full independence, uh, uh, breaking from the motherland, I think this is very complicated issue because first of all, there are so many most of the people of Syria, they don't agree change, any changes in the border and also in the international community. And number two is that those, there is no pure Kurdish areas. These areas in the, the, the northeast, they are mixed uh, Kurds, Christians, uh, Syriacs, and uh, Arabs. So if you are going to give certain geographical area as independent for Kurds, you need to do some kind of immigration of the others to other areas, which is becoming, you know, even making it more difficult and more complicated. But the people who are in the, um, the Kurdish parties who are with us, they are all, uh, they are not asking for independence right now. They are just asking for to be still in included in the, in the Syria, but with having some kind of decentralizing the local governors from the uh, centra, center in Damascus. Um, just a closing remark, you know, um, we have two very dispassionate uh, presentations, um, but if you listen closely, it is chilling what both Hanin and Munzer are saying about the situation in Syria and in the situation around Syria. Um, uh, I am, maybe I, my antenna are, are on ultra high, but I hear from Munzer this cri de cour that we have nothing, that we aren't getting the food, that let alone we aren't getting the weapons. And we are, the, the other guy isn't going to win, but we are on the verge of a catastrophe. And I'm hearing from Hanin the recipe for a truly horrific region-wide religious battle, something unlike we have seen in the world since the Middle Ages in Europe, um, being triggered by this dramatic expulsion of millions of Sunnis into the already smoldering cauldron of Lebanon's sectarian and confessional situation. And that's just only one border of Syria. Um, extrapolate that out to the Jordanian situation um, where there is not as many, but there is uh, one out of six Jordanians is now a refugee. And you can see how this is spiraling out from Syria as well as deepening within Syria. Uh, this panel, a uh, fantastic discussion, um, just underscores in my view the urgency of action and leadership on this issue. So let me thank Andrew, thank Hanin, and thank Munzer for this panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much.